I love all these cameras on, guys. Love it, love it, love it. I'm going to give you snaps for that, all my cameras on. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Sean, I'm going to call you out. Sean Greenlee. Ah, there you are. <laughs> there he is. Okay, good. We do have some more guys in. That's good. Okay. Okay. I think uh, with everybody here, let's go ahead and get this thing started. We've got a lot of uh, great, great content to share. So with a huge shout out, welcome everyone to the Green Apron Alliance continuing racial equity conversations. Thank you for joining us today. It's lovely to see everybody's faces. Um, we do have everybody on uh, mute just because it helps with uh, the speed and uh, keeping us on track. Um, hopefully you guys can uh, bear with us. There's all kinds of uh, challenges on technology. Some of, it, some of it is a little bit slower. Some of it freezes, just bear with us. We're gonna be right there. Um, I want to uh, welcome everybody, and this is a huge year for us. On uh, January 25th, Green Apron Alliance will be celebrating their birthday, so I want to make sure you guys uh, recognize that we're going to have a party to celebrate at the end of the month, and because parties always have lots of fun things going on with it, we're planning quite the uh, festive uh, time from the party of January 25th all the way on through the month of February. Um, this uh, event that we're doing tonight with racial equity is just the first of many to come. Uh, and we hope to see all of your faces and participation going forward. Uh, January 25th, we're actually going to try something different. Excuse me, 28th, we're going to do uh, online yoga. So hopefully you guys show up with Karen Soul doing some yoga. And uh, we've got a s'mores event on February 18th. So we're gonna get fat online, it'll be fun. Uh, we've got job fairs and we've got lots of more, lots of other things happening. Um, with that being said, uh, because this event is super important, uh, Lisa has agreed to come back on and host us um, with another racial equity event. So thank you, Lisa. Lisa is a founding board member of Green Apron Alliance and a huge contributor so, to some incredible content that you all have been uh, benefiting and, and using. Lisa is going to walk us through a conversation tonight with a friend of mine and someone who I have for the last couple of years uh, treasured in my personal um, endowment. Uh, Dolly Chu is a professor, at, a Harvard-educated professor working at New, uh, New York University. But more importantly, Dolly is um, an incredible person who brings us uh, great insights with a newsletter. So even though she's written this incredible book, um, The Person You Mean to Be, How Good People Fight Bias, she also has a, uh, a newsletter that we would love for you to take advantage of. So we'll be sharing uh, as follow-up uh, the information on how to get uh, access to her newsletter and to get access to some more uh, content that she is uh, preparing. And one quick thing, we just added this in. If you participate by offering a great question or comment in the chat section at the end of the evening, we're going to do a random drawing and we will be sending you a copy of Dolly's book. So please uh, participate and please get involved. But with that, without further ado, I want to kick it over to the one and only Lisa Sunshine Smith to take it from here. So thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Marie. Thanks for that warm welcome. I am so delighted to see so many familiar faces. Um, once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for spending the afternoon. The next 45 minutes, I'm sure is guaranteed to gonna be eye-opening. I'm gonna learn some things and I hope all of you are gonna learn some things along with me. Um, as Marie said, this is the third installment as a part of our racial equity series. You've heard from Starbucks alums in previous series. And this time we're gonna welcome Dr. Dolly. Um, I'm gonna stick to calling her Dr. Dolly Chu. Um, she's just incredible. I've um, had a chance to um, get, um, get to know her through her book. 
Um, but I'm really excited to be leading this conversation today. Um, as also, as Marie mentioned, I do have some prepared questions, but the real juice of it is gonna be in how much you engage. Please drop questions in the chat. I'm gonna do my best to monitor the chat and drop in those questions as well. So don't be shy. Um, for me as a moderator, and I'm sure Dadali too, if you keep her cameras on, we can kind of see how you're reacting, how things are resonating with you. So definitely, Keep your cameras on as much as possible. Um, also, there are new features in Zoom. So if you have the latest features, feel free um, to use them, the claps, the hearts, whatever those emojis are, just as visual indicators for us to let you know, um, to let us know how things are going. Um, and then I also want to add that um, Alex, you'll see her in the gallery. She's our GAA comms. She's also going to be helping um, moderate with me in terms of the questions in the chat, just to make sure that I don't miss anything. So um, be on the lookout for her, or if you want to um, pose your question to her directly, that's okay too. Um, so with that, welcome Dolly. Hey, Dr. Dolly. <laughs> um, so with that, let me just dive right in to your book. The book, The Person You Mean to Be, was published in 2018. And I would suspect that you started to think about and you know put together your outline for what this book was going to be long before what is today racial unrest and all of this conversation about bias and things like that. Can you tell me, tell us what inspired you to tackle this and what was your journey um, throughout that process? Oh. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having me. Thank you for everyone for joining from all the different spots you're at, um, at a time when it feels difficult to <laughs> be anywhere and do anything. So thank you for being in this space with us. Um, Lisa, I wrote this book because I needed this book. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, mm -hmm. like I, this, you know, there is a, um, an expression amongst researchers and scholars that um, sometimes research is me search. And I would, I would own that here that um, I've been, I've been in the field of social psychology and organizational behavior since 2001. That's when I began life as a researcher, as a second career, I was in the corporate world. I have an MBA for 11 years before I had this like mid thirties epiphany that I meant to be a professor and, and sort of <laughs> made a pivot in that direction. Um, and so since 2001, I've really been, been trying to take the tools and theories and methods of science to study the questions that I grapple with in my daily life. And then I think so many of us grapple with um, where we, you know, I, I sort of get very judgmental of, um, you know, someone else's sense of humor. And then I find myself making jokes that sort of seem similar and I think are funny and or I um you know a, a student will um you know send me an email and say gosh that reading you assigned in class was was in, had a lot of sexism in it or a lot of racism or a lot of ableism I I've, I've gotten all three of those and I'm like what how dare they and then I like reread it for the hundredth time reread the thing and I'm like whoa, how could I not have noticed that until it was pointed out to me? So like these moments of grappling and of, of learning, um, there, there's, there's science that can help us. There's science that can help us notice more and learn more and understand more. And um, the deeper, in the last 20 years, the deeper I've gotten into doing the science piece of it, the more I've realized the rest of the world doesn't have access to that. And so I wrote a book that curated the stories of the real world, like my stories, other people's stories. Um, that's where I got to be kind of a, a, like a amateur journalist, not like Courtney, who's going to be a real journalist, but, but, you know, me, a sort of fake journalist interviewing people and then curating that with science, studies, evidence, research, mm -hmm. um, and, and make it available and accessible for a broad audience. That was my goal. Yeah, you know, as you're saying science, 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 I get a chuckle because we live in a world where science is challenged right now. So um, I love, you know, the fact that your book and your methodology is grounded in science is pretty awesome given the environment around um, the thinking around science. 
Um, early in your book, you talk about the importance of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And I would say that many Starbucks alums are very familiar with those words coming from Starbucks and that, you know, the, the early language of growth and fixed mind. Well, we focus on growth, not so much the fixed. Um, but in the context of fighting bias, the name of your book, right? Um, can you give us insight into these terms and how do you, how should we apply the meaning? Yeah, absolutely. And it's so wonderful that that's already something that's been embraced. Um, The the research of growth mindset, as you know, shows that when we view ourselves as a work in progress in in any domain, in in public speaking or in cooking or in math or whatever, when we view ourselves as a work in progress in that domain, we actually do get better. Even if we started out great, or even if we started out very, um, very uh, low in ability, we, we persist more, we um, take feedback better. Uh, there's really cool brain scan studies that show when you when someone's simply just asked to think in a fixed mindset, meaning just uh, this, this um, it, when it comes to math abilities, your math abilities are fairly fixed, fixed mindset. When it comes to math abilities, your math abilities are malleable and can be learned, growth mindset. Just those simple statements, and then you have people do math problems and then show them their mistakes while they're they're in a brain scanner, that in the fixed mindset, you actually see brain activity drop when the mistakes are pointed mm-hmm. out, right? Like literally we, attention is like being pulled away that you can see it physically in the brain because there's, if you're in a fixed mindset, what good is the mistake? It will not lead to mm-hmm. anything, right? Because you're fixed. In the growth mindset, you see the opposite. You see these like boop, 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 boop like all sorts of activity in the brain, because like, I may not like that mistake, but boy, I got to go dig for what I can get out of it. What I wanted to do was take this work that we already know on fixed and growth mindset into a domain that for some reason we don't seem to find, like it's in everything else, like math, public speaking, cooking. But for some reason, when it comes to things like diversity, inclusion, equity, bias, racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, we, I don't know, we just think we were supposed to be born knowing how to do it. And to, and and, and in a world that's changing quickly around us, we're supposed to somehow understand it all in a body and a mind that was, grew up in whatever bubble it grew up in, believing or being told whatever it was told, soaking up the environment around us, we're somehow supposed to be able to just overcome all that Um, without any learning or practice or mistakes or feedback. And that makes no logical sense, obviously. And so, so the, 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 what I wanted to do was intersect that work on mindset with this other domain that many of us care deeply about. And my vocabulary around that is that when we think of ourselves as I am a good person in that kind of like, you can literally feel your shoulder. I'm a good person. That that is a very either or fixed mindset mentality versus when we think of ourselves as I am what I call a goodish person, I am always getting better. I am always learning more. There are TV shows I watched a year ago, five years ago and 10 years ago that embarrass me today. And that's good. That shouldn't be bad. That's good. That means I have grown I am noticing more, I'm owning it, I'm learning from it, that's being goodish. So good person mindset, fixed, mind, uh, fixed mindset, goodish person growth mindset. That's how I've been thinking about it. Thank you for um, clarifying that. I love that term, goodish. Um, I think, uh, you know, when I think about my own you know, journey in this space, because I wasn't always here either. Um, I'm an immigrant to this country. I've shared that story before. And so being an immigrant, I just kind of came into this environment thinking this, these, this is the way it was. And I grew up, but then, you know, and, and I, I thought what I learned in college was all there is to know. And then I come out and come into the corporate world and realize there's so much more about racial equity and the racial divide and how we got here that I was just unaware. I didn't even know to ask the question. So I love this idea of how do we, you know, continue to have that growth mindset so we can be open to even think to ask 
the right to ask that question. I, lo I love I love how you explain that. That's right. We don't even know to ask or we are scared to ask. Um, and that's a big part of being goodish as well is uh, finding a way to get answers to our questions or to get the questions. And there's lots of resources uh, for doing that. And part of being goodish is also uh, not hiding behind the fact that we don't know, like assuming we don't know, uh, if you think you know everything, then we know you don't know everything. That that's you know that right there is sort of the giveaway. Um, yeah, those are facts right there. You're spitting truth. <laughs> um, Sean dropped a question in the chat that I think um, lends to kind of the topic that we're talking about. He says many of us are a product of our environment, which culturally lends itself to a fixed mindset. It's called kind of the cultural fixed mindset, specifically when it comes you know, to cultural tolerance and things like that, how would you target your approach to help them shift towards a growth mindset? Yeah, that's it. I'll, I'll let you absorb that question. Sure, sure. No, I, I think I got it. Uh, thanks, Sean. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, what I find most effective is, um, and I'm an educator, so you're going to hear my bias in this, is making my own learning visible to others. Like that's mm. how I find it easiest to invite them into the, the space. You know, another way to think about that is making uh, my growth mindset contagious. You know, gosh, that word used to mean so many different things than it does now. But, <laughs> but um, yeah. the, 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 most people are walking around, at least in the United States, and I think this would, might be true in many other um, societies as well, with a fixed mindset, with a good person mindset on these issues. So to start out without loosening that up a little bit, I don't, I think it just, it, it breaks, it brittles, they re retreat, the brain scan, remember the activity, you know? So I think the place to get there is um, to first sort of say, gosh, you know, I did something someone told me the other day, I didn't realize uh, that, that I was, um, when I refer to good neighborhoods, I didn't realize what all the layers to what I was saying. I didn't even really unpack what I meant by it until someone did me the favor of pulling me aside and talking me through that a little bit. Would you mind if I talked to you through what I learned? You know, that that's a that's an entry point of of learning. Now, I want to be really clear, and this is also in my book. I am not saying that every one of us has the responsibility to go educate and discuss and meet people where they are and make them comfortable and make our learning visible. I am not saying that. I am saying that Sean's question says, I'm trying to shift someone towards a growth mindset. So if that is the goal, then that I think that approach is effective. We don't always have to shift people to a growth mindset to make change. Like there's lots of ways in which we can bring the heat versus the light and just push for change. And that that's, I, I also fully endorse that. Well, you know, I want to unpack all the ways at some point. I mean, that, that, you know, um, because we live in a um, passive aggressive construct, right? And so it'll be nice at some point um, further, maybe further along in the conversation, like how do we deal with that passive aggressiveness. Um, and I love that people are dropping their comments in the chat. Um, what are the key, and this is from Jennifer, what are the key elements to creating a growth mindset in an environment that is toxic? Mm -hmm. um, I think we're kind of living in that right now um, where it feels toxic, depending on you know your, your purview of the world. Um, if you have any thoughts you could share about that to Jennifer's point. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I... Um, we're, we're not going to get everybody. And, right. and I think we, we, um, that isn't even the goal. It doesn't need to be the goal. I think in the last, um, few years, we have seen the power of tipping points and, yes. and, and a variety of directions. And so, uh, it, one of the things I talk about in the book, and thank you, Marie, for mentioning the newsletter. This, this is also in one of my newsletters. I think it was like last summer. It was one of maybe the August or S September newsletter. Um, it's on my website, dollychook.com slash newsletter. The 20-60-20 rule, the idea with the 20-60-20 mm -hmm. rule is that, let's say, um, 
you know, I've, I've, there's an instance, it's online or it's in person and there's a situation and I need to make a split second decision. Do I say something? Um, 20% of the time that person, these are made up numbers. This is not science-based. The idea is just being like, it's a number that isn't hundred percent. 20% of the people are going to be really open to that conversation. They genuinely didn't know good neighborhood was, they hadn't thought it through, but they want to understand growth mindset, goodish. If you think that's the situation, engage, just find the right moment, come at it with love, engage. Uh, but that's not the toxic example that Jennifer's talking about here. Another 20%, the closed 20% is, is, is probably in that toxic category. They're never coming with you, but they have the potential to influence that middle 60, right? 20, 60, 20, they have the potential to influence that middle 60. And so what you want to do is not get sucked in to a back and forth that will wear you down with that closed 20. And instead you, you may want to refute them, but while you're talking to them, know that your audience is this middle 60. So to make this very concrete, you're on Facebook, you're in the comments, blah, 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 right? Back, forth, back, forth, toxic, toxic, toxic. Well, we all know that a whole bunch of us are reading that thread and not commenting, aren't we? Aren't we like going back and like watching and, you know, that's the audience. The folks who aren't commenting but are reading are potentially influenceable. So rather than trying to convince um, you know, my toxic friend here of anything, because I'm not going to. I can still respond in, 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 that, in that newsletter. I, I offer a few different responses. But what I then want to do is without trying to convince that person, write a response that I know everyone else is, is listening. In person, this works as well. And so mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, where we are now is the toxicity is has gotten to the point where, you um, Toxicity with power is a whole different ball game and education isn't necessarily going to help with that. Um, and I'm not, I'm not well equipped to, to speak or I don't have the expertise to speak on that, but there's still a whole bunch of people just watching and they can be influenced. That's, that's fantastic. Um, thanks for illuminating on, on that point. Um, I love what you said about where you can write your response in the terms of social media that will draw in that 60%. And I think that alone gives me pause. Like, how am I crafting my responses? Because in the heat of situations and what's happening, I'm heated too. I'm just as heated as the person coming at me. And so how can I kind of shift my thinking to think about, okay, I really want to go after that 60%. And that's, that's a really um, fantastic thought to kind of anchor you know, social responses um, in this, particularly in this current environment. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I, I find it most useful in, in the moments where I freeze usually, to be honest. Like yeah. I have such a catalog in my brain of moments where I have frozen and couldn't come up with anything and didn't know what to say or whether I should and therefore nothing happened. And having the 2060-20 rule just sitting in your head it, it has liberated me to now I can, I, know I also have a catalog of instances where I haven't frozen, where I've made, quickly made the assessment of 20 or 60 and I've acted. Yeah, I love that. I, I I'm, I'm uh, you know, I wrote that down. I think this is just good stuff. Good stuff. Lisa, can um, I say one more thing about it? Sorry. I, I know yeah. you were about to say something. Um, I, I just want to clarify one thing I just said. I also want to be clear that in doing the 20, 60, 20, it's actually a form of stereotyping and we don't always get it right. And I also have a catalog in my head of instances, a shorter, shorter catalog, but of instances where I definitely got it wrong. I'll give a quick example. Um, somebody who was uh, a volunteer in a sort of extracurricular activity for my children, who I thought was sort of a great, person and great role model, uh, you know, volunteer parent in a sporting activity until I started seeing some stuff on social media that really concerned me. And I was doing some back and forth and there was some doubling down going on. And I started to like really question 
whether my kids should be in this activity. And um, <laughs> they both got injured, so had to pull out of the activity. So I never had to make the hard decision. But as a result, we sort of drifted away from the person. Two years passed. Now, I have written him off as a closed 20. Like I got into it, but then I was like, never mind. And I just stopped. I wrote him off. He's not in a position, once he wasn't dealing with my kids, he's not in a position to do direct harm to my kids. Um, and two years later, I take my kids out for ice cream. And it's one of these long ice cream shops where you, you eat your ice cream here and then you can see the people entering like sort of down the hall. And we're sitting there eating and my daughter goes, look, it's, and I'm like, no, God, finish your ice cream. Hurry, hurry, hurry. but mom, we can't back down. I'm like, no, 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 finish, finish, finish. We gotta go, there's a back entrance, we're out. And sure enough, before we can get out, he sees us and starts beelining over. And I'm like, shoot, now he's like, there, I don't remember what was going on in the news, but I was like, it, he's gonna come at me about the thing, whatever the thing was. I'm so glad I saw you. I have been thinking about you and you know what? Mm -hmm. I think you are onto something. That stuff you said, I, I think I was missing it. And I joined the diversity committee at my organization. In a million years, I didn't see that one coming. In a million years, I didn't see that one coming. This was before 2019 as well. So, you know, there's a lot of people who sort of jumped in in 2019 you know, but this was before that. So sometimes you get it wrong and I, I got it wrong in where I put him, but you know, that, that comes with the territory. It sounds like he, he offered, he moved from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. He, absolutely. That's a beautiful connection. Yeah. So yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that that's what that sounds like. And so I, I love that, that that nuance that you're talking about is really that opportunity that growth could happen, even when we are not seeing it happen in front of our very eyes. And so that's a really powerful example um, that I'm definitely going to take to heart as well, because I'm quick to, to cut somebody off. I'll tell you that I'm one of those people. Um, so I'm really, really thankful for this guidepost kind of that, that you've given us. Um, I'm going to pivot just a slight pivot on this. So um, this year in particular, and I don't mean 2021, because it's only 14 days and a lot has happened. People are thought this is just the mirror image of 2020. Um, <laughs> right. Um, this year in particular has revealed that unconscious bias doesn't mean bias is invisible. And I think this is something that you've touched on in your book. For those of us on the receiving end of bias, we see it and feel it all the time. At least I'm speaking for self mm -hmm. in this moment. Um, unconscious bias is something that we're all kind of embracing right now. It's something that's been a part of the corporate vernacular for some years. It's been talked about. We're workshopping it to death, all of that. But tell me a little bit more about what you mean when you say bias is not invisible. You know, I, um, I have been working on my latest newsletter. I was working on it earlier today. And the theme I was using was um, thought experiments. So maybe y'all will be the first to hear this. Let's see how it goes. Um, so a thought experiment is, is basically asking a what if statement of yourself, kind of doing a simulation, right? Mm. So, um, you know, uh, you read a performance evaluation and it says this person, um, you know, is quick to anger. And then in your head, you, you, you switch the, the gender identity of the person, like, you know, instead of it being female, I'm going to make it male, or I'm going to make, um, so this person being black, I'm going to make them white. I'm going to make uh, this, this uh, black female, a white male, let's say in my, what if, and in doing that simulation, it, it helps me make my own biases visible, as well as the biases that are baked into what's happening around me, whether they're implicit biases or systemic biases. And these kind of what if statements, I, I was actually looking up pictures um, to illustrate, and there's some great 
illustrations by artists as well as photographers of this, where, for example, um, there's somebody, he, he actually, while he was in prison, uh, developed a series of drawings where he took Amer draw, like illustrations from American history books and reversed the racism of them. Mm. Right, so you can do that mental simulation of what does that look like, uh, Native Americans and colonizers, um, kidnapped Africans and white um, slave owners. Like he, he made the visual of it, and I, the visceral reaction I had when I looked at those pictures, like ooh made my, some of my own biases visible to me, right? Just the fact mm -hmm. that I was so stunned by it. And so I think that's what part of what we're trying to do is make biases visible. I, I, that's so powerful what you said, Lisa, that on the receiving end, it's, it's visible, it's palpable, it's feelable. Mm -hmm. um, the metaphor of headwinds and tailwinds is one I borrow uh, from Debbie Irving, writer Debbie Irving in the book, and she talks about headwinds and tailwinds where, you know, um, if you go for a run or a bike ride or a walk and you have the wind at your back, you don't feel it, right? You just think, hmm, this is no carb thing. Way to go. Like, I got this, right? And then you like, you get to that tree where you turn around to come home and now you're just you turning back and now you got the wind in your face and you feel it and you slow down and maybe you feel less motivated. And if someone was looking out the window at this scene, they wouldn't see the wind slowing you down in your face. They would just see someone who didn't look that motivated or comes from a community that doesn't seem to value bike riding. You know, like the, there'll be all sorts of attributions made. And so that's another mm -hmm. version of this like visibility thing is that um, we have to listen to and trust the people who are feeling and seeing the yeah. headwinds, we, we won't feel it. That That is the whole point. When we say, well, that's not, I've never noticed that, or it's never happened to me, or I've never observed that happening to anyone else, that is the whole point. Yeah, I mean, th those are really, really great examples because, you know, I don't know how many times I've had to express even in a corporate environment, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm receiving. And to be met with, that can't be true. That can't <laughs> you know, be true. That's not, yeah, that can't be true. I, I you know, it, it's, un, it, it's utter disbelief that what I'm saying could even remotely be true just because of their um, level of experience with the topic by which I'm, I'm talking about. So I really um, love that it's kind of putting ourselves in that what if, I, I kind of go back to your what if, an, an analogy even in this particular situation. Um, a question came in that said, what is the best way to find out? Um, it came in directly to me, so you're not gonna see it. Um, what is the best way to find out what your personal biases are so that you have a baseline to work from? Yeah. Um, I'd recommend trying uh, the implicit association test. It's often referred to as the IAT. And um, you can find it at implicit.harvard.edu. It's, um, it's a psychological measure. I, I did my PhD in the lab that's sort of the central you know, intellectual uh, developer of, of this um, this test. It's not a perfect test. It's not something you should take as absolute truth. I do recommend if you can even take it more than once in sort of different moods and different, different um, situations. But what it does do is you go in as an, a guest, you don't need to register or give any personal information. You um, pick when you get to that website, uh, there's a, a drop down menu, pick the flag or country that you feel most captures like your upbringing or your, your, um, your of cultural affiliation. And then that will lead you to a menu of tests you can take and you pick the subject that you want to explore. If you pick United States, for example, it, you'll probably get the race test and the gender and the sexual orientation and a whole bunch um, will come up. It'll, it'll be different by culture though. If you pick India, you're gonna get the Hindu Muslim 
IAT, you wouldn't get that if you picked the United States because it's not a salient um, cultural issue here. Um, and then it's about a 10 minute task. It's best to do it on a computer. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> don't touch the camera. <laughs> Hands off. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's best to do where you have a keyboard as opposed to a tablet or a phone. Like it works better with buttons because it's almost like you're playing a video game. You're like do, 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 responding quickly. And when you do that at the end of the 10 minutes, you'll get a result that will tell you based off of the speed at which you responded to stimuli, pictures and words on the screen, how um, the faster you respond, you associate certain ideas that suggest that's a stronger cognitive association. So Lisa, maybe you can help me demonstrate this real quick. If I say peanut butter, you say? Jelly. jelly. Exactly. <laughs> and so if, if, if we were not on mute, we could have all done this together. And my guess is many of us would have said jelly, maybe not all. For those of us who have said peanut butter and jelly so quickly, that means those ideas are closely associated in our minds. We may not know when or how they became associated. We don't remember a specific moment in our lives. We may be allergic to peanuts. We may hate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but still, uh, despite our explicit views, we have this implicit association between peanut butter and jelly. And that's essentially what the IAT is doing is, is uh, kind of seeing what ideas hang together in our minds. Okay, so um, just to just close the, the chapter on that particular question. So you're recommending that we go to this website. I think someone was kind to drop it in there for us. Take Thank this you. test and that insight will kind of help us understand our foundation for where we sit with bias and then start that growth mindset process. Exactly, it'll give you some insight on implicit bias and it'll there's frequently asked questions that you can explore and if you, Take the test and you're like, that can't be true. It's I'm left-handed or I'm this, like you're gonna come up with your brain, whether you like it or not, your brain is going to be brilliant in coming up with explanations of why it can't be true. All your brilliance will will arrive and, and then you'll go to the frequently asked questions and work through it. And then I'll go from there. Um, so to, to tag on on that, and then I'm gonna get to a question in the chat because it's provocative for me for sure. Um, the question that I have for you is how deeply rooted in racism is unconscious bias and how much is racism perpetuated by unconscious bias? Yeah. I mean, those, that's kind of a mouthful there, but um, would love to get your thoughts on, on th those two themes. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to substitute the word systemic racism for racism. Uh, Okay. systemic bias, because I, I think we're saying the same thing, but I just want to sort of be precise. Um, this was the area of the greatest learning for me in writing the book. I was maybe a third of the way or halfway through the process of writing the book. I'd already, you know, signed a book contract with Harper Collins and, you know, agreed on an, a pretty detailed outline, 60 page book proposal, like we were into it. And about halfway through, I was doing those, my little amateur journalist interviews, and I was interviewing like really cool people like Jody Pico, the best-selling author, and Tommy Kale, the director of Hamilton, as well as others who you, names you won't know, but, but amazing people, all of whom were talking about how they grapple with these issues. And the word systemic kept coming up in the interviews. And I was like, I don't know why they keep bringing up the systemic stuff. I'm a social psychologist. We just kind of deal with, like, you know, maybe like how individuals around me affect my brain, but we're kind of unit of analysis as the individual. What is all this system stuff? Go talk to the sociologists. That's their thing. And then I, you know, I was like, but let me go do a little bit of reading. And then suddenly I was like, oh, oh my goodness. Like, why, why aren't we all talking to each other? Because what happens is, and there's a whole chapter in the book where I explore this, and I use the case study of the GI Bill is how I do this. I, I, if anybody remembers that movie Sliding Doors, where someone like just makes it into the subway in New York City subway before the doors close or just misses it. And then the movie does a like side by side what their lives would have been like. It, it sort of unfolds differently because of that one second of, of difference. I do the same thing in the book chapter. I say, um, I take 
someone named Colleen in, in the current times. And I say if Colleen's grandfather had been born black versus white and served uh, uh, um, in the military in World War II and came home, thank God, safely as a veteran, and then either could access the benefits of the GI Bill, home ownership and college tuition as a white veteran, or couldn't as a black veteran, which by the way, I didn't even know about that. I somehow missed that in US history. And when I say somehow, I mean, it was never taught to me and it was never taught to most of us. And then we take, we go through uh, Colleen's life, or Colleen's grandparents and then parents and then her life. And we see the intersection of systemic and implicit bias. And what it shows up as is things like, well, in Colleen's life, some people, uh, are, are more college educated than others. Some people live in better neighborhoods than others. There was an air quotes there. Uh, some people um, own homes, whereas other people live in apartments and move a lot. And that must say something about motivation and, and uh, worthiness and ability and talent, except when you start to unpack, so, so all these implicit biases get formed, which show up really robustly on the IAT, the over 20 million IATs that have been taken show really strong associations between, um, at least in the United States, between African-American and less education and less smart and, um, and bad words that are bad and uh, danger, things like that. But when you play it back and you realize well, wait, there's all these systemic biases, the GI Bill, the redlining, um, that's both past and present taking place that have led to these gigantic disparities. But my brain is coding it. Remember peanut butter jelly? I don't know where I got it from. My brain has coded it as that's how things are. So now I've got all these implicit biases that are a function of the systemic biases around me, but I am not coding it as systemic biases. I'm not even coding it as implicit biases. I'm just coding it as that's the way it is. I'm not noticing yeah. it. And Lisa, you gave such a uh, powerful example when you said when you came to this country and you're sort of like trying to decode what you're seeing around you, like that decoding um, is what we need to do even when we're immersed in it, when we've only known right. this version of it. Right. And I can tell you, this is an old term, but as an immigrant, it was always about assimilation. I went from my Afro to pressed hair. It, it, back in, in the 70s, it was about how do you come into this country and just assimilate to the way things are and mirror kind of the vanity that was around um, us. And so I won't go into that, but that's just kind of a fine point of, you know, it is what it is and we just kind of accept it without challenging it. And I'm so glad that now we have the vocabulary by which to start to challenge that. And so Elizabeth dropped something in our comments um, there that says the shameful behavior in Washington, DC clearly shows white privilege and the disparity in how seditionists are treated versus Black Lives Matter protest. Um, you, you see that there. And then is there a way to discuss all of this without using the term white privilege? Because I know that ultimately gets a visceral, no, I pulled myself by my brute steps. I don't have white privilege. I mean, there is that kind of a thing too. So I would, I would love to hear your insights on that. Yeah. Well, I do. I have found the headwinds and tailwinds. Actually, that's all that is, is privilege. That's, that's exactly what that metaphor is, is, is um, mm -hmm. and, and it allows us to talk about different forms of privilege. You know, I am not, um, I don't have white male privilege, but I do have um, English as my native language. I am a documented citizen of the United States. Uh, I have all sorts, all kinds of privilege. Um, I'm straight. Uh, I don't even think about my privileges. And that, of course, is exactly what tailwinds are. I don't feel them. I don't think about them. In my book, I talk about ordinary privilege, where I take the concept of privilege and actually try to bolster our understanding with the research that says that those areas where we have privilege, where we have tailwinds, we actually also have tremendous influence and power. The research says that, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if an issue comes up, um, where I'm directly impacted, like let's say, say someone tells, uh, I'm, my, my parents immigrated from India. Let's say somebody, uh, and my husband wears a turban. Let's say somebody tells a joke about uh, men who wear turbans. 
um, and I or my husband speaks up, we we will be taken less seriously than if someone who isn't from the targeted group speaks up. That's what the research says, is that in those side by side comparisons, uh, mm -hmm. ironically, the person who's less affected is sort of viewed as more legitimate in that context. So what that means, though, is is all those areas where we're like, no, no, I don't have privilege. I'm like, bring it on. What privileges do I have? I can use that. I, I instead mm -hmm. of feeling helpless and ashamed, which is how we sometimes feel when we're totally a privilege, I can actually say, wow, I've got tools. I've got influence that I didn't even realize I had. Um, so I think headwinds and tailwinds, ordinary privilege, and then this what if, these thought experiments, that's the other, yeah, that, actually the, the example Elizabeth is giving is exactly what is prompting the, that being the topic of the next newsletter is this, um, you know, obvious difference in, in how uh, if, if um, black or brown bodies had been uh, breaking glass or had been doing any number of things that are mind blowing. Um, we, I think it's very clear and hard to dispute what would have happened. Thank you. And we just have like a few more minutes. So for those who have a question, please drop it in the chat. We'll try, make sure we try and get to it. Um, you talk about in your book about being a believer and a builder. What's the difference? And how do they work together? Yeah. Believer well, and that came from, um, there was like a lot of back and forth between me and my publisher at the beginning over who the audience for the book was. And, you know, mm. there was, there was worries that, you know, are you, are you just singing to the choir? And um, as my, uh, Kathy Phillips, who, uh, who unfortunately passed away uh, almost exactly a year ago. Um, but the wonderful scholar, Kathy Phillips, uh, used to say, uh, but, the, but the, the, the choir needs to learn how to sing. Um, so there's nothing wrong with singing to the choir. But um, the, the, I, I started to realize, well, I think to Kathy's point, I am, okay, I am speaking to the choir, but the choir, what makes them the choir is that they believe in a lot of things. They believe in equity. They believe in diversity. They believe in science. They believe in data. They, they, you know, we, we all are still learning there. There's a lot of things we may not know, but, but I'm, I'm on board. I'm not, I'm not convinced as 40% of, of Americans are that, that white people face more racism than black people in you know, the United States. Um, so, so I'm a believer in that sense, but my argument as many have made, is that just believing it and not acting on it is not helpful and may even be harmful because we then are perpetuating and think we think we're helping, but we're actually perpetuating. So what I wanted to do was um, offer a path towards building tools, building strategy, building confidence, building courage, building communities, building organizations, building teams, building families where we can take those beliefs and move them into action. Um, one of my mentors, uh, after he, the book was published and he read it, said, gosh, but he said, I went through the whole book thinking, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm only a believer. I'm never going to be a builder. And I was like, no, 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 it's like a continuum. And he's like, well, you didn't write it like it was a continuum. You wrote it like it was either or. And I was like, yeah, shoot, sequel. Um, so it's, it, please ignore, if you do read the book, please ignore that either or feeling that's so growth, that's so fixed mindset of me. Of course, it's meant to be that, that we're, we can move in that direction. I like that. I like that. Um, I'm definitely, you know, just, um, I, I feel like sometimes I sit in both spaces, right? I am, I, I am believing while I'm building and building while I'm believing, because sometimes I'm like, oh my God. And you get that, you know, that the wind sucked out of you, you know, just like this past week, you know, you get it all knocked out of you and then you got to take a nice inhale of conversations like these that kind of inoculate you for the next, the next thing. And, um, exactly. Lisa, give you those wanna... kinds of tools. Oh, I'm sorry. We had a little delay. Sorry to talk over you. Um, for exactly that reason, I wrote um, the very first newsletter I wrote, and it was actually the reason I launched the newsletter was the 10% more rule. And I really encourage um, us all to sort of adopt that. The 10% more rule is 
that some of us are new to this conversation. I'm guessing if you're on this, you're probably not super new to this conversation, but but many people are. Um, and for those uh, people, 10% more, uh, doing 10% more means being 10% more mortified, not looking away, paying attention. Right. For, for those who have been in the conversation, who hashtagged, who volunteered, who donated, but not taken any personal risk, 10% more is 10% more terrified. It's time to do something. Mm -hmm. And for those, Lisa, and I, I, I think you're, the way you're explaining, I, I hear you in this, uh, for those who are exhausted, who are in this on the front lines of it all the time, maybe because of the identities we hold or the work we do, it's 10% more satisfied, air quotes satisfied, meaning I can come out of the game and catch my breath and know that others are going to cover and I can come back, not satisfied that the work is done, but satisfied that I don't have to be in the game every minute. 10% um, is a good goal setting researchers tell us we need achievable, uh, but challenging goals. And I think doing 10% more than we were before feels like that. Achievable. Well, Dolly, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to um, leave space for Marie to do some closing, but I just wanted to thank you for your time. I mean, although I'm the moderator, I have like a full page of notes that I'm going to take home, you know, take back and kind of really sit with it. Um, because I think it's in the reflecting that learning actually happens. And so I, 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 I am thankful that you've given me a lot to reflect on and to think through, builder, you know, um, believer, the 26, the 2060, 20 rule bill game on. I'm definitely going to think about that every time. So I definitely appreciate having these tools to really guide kind of how I start to think about 2021 and what lays ahead. Um, the promise that 2021 brings as well, um, because without hope, what are we doing this for, right? So I'm thankful um, for you. I look forward to, I, I hear you're working on another book, so I can't wait. I hope you'll come back again if um, Marie has her powers. Hopefully we'll have you back again very, very Powerful. soon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> her superpowers. But with that, I want to thank you, our audience. Um, please um, extend your thanks, but I'm going to pass it off to Marie to close us out. Thank you. Lisa. Thanks, Thanks Dolly. for the conversation. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. This was uh, wonderful to see everyone. And, you know, for the years that I've been touting and carrying this book around, and it's super dog-eared uh, and, and overly shared, and the bindings cracked on it. Um, I am super excited because I keep learning and learning and learning. So again, just to remind everyone, I was reminded on how to make my learning more visible. So I thought that was really a, a great takeaway for me and that, you know, it's okay to be a little bit humble and to understand that you, I don't have all the answers. I wish I did, but I don't. Um, and, you know, when to bring the heat and when to bring the light, uh, you know, I, 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 that is, could not be more of a good reminder than in these last few days when uh, things just get really kind of fired up. And I know looking at uh, Catherine Chang, she and I can get on a, a phone call and bring some freaking heat. Uh, but I know that sometimes being a, a light source is probably a better uh, application for that. Um, again, thank you, Dolly. Um, you know, one thing I mentioned at the beginning of this is that if you participated with comments and uh, questions, um, you know, we would be very thrilled to forward uh, a copy of the book. And while we were on chat, uh, Dolly very graciously offered to sign the book. So not only will you get a copy of the book, you're going to get a signed autographed uh, version of it. And my only ask is that uh, to the award winner, and frankly, to all of you, if you don't mind, take this learning with you and propel it forward, share it and amplify it. Um, we all own the opportunity to make this world a better place. And, you know, that's what keeps me going. And so if I know that all of you are armed and focused on uh, doing the same thing, I know we will make this a better year, a better place, a better life for many. So with that, I think we're in agreement. The um, award winner for the book 
was picked completely randomly, let me say. Uh, but let's all give a shout out to Sean Greenlee for getting a copy of the book. Uh, I'll make sure Dolly puts her, her signature on that for you. And we will uh, work with you, Sean, to figure out how to get it to you. So again, uh, everyone, thank you for joining us. We will be recording this sharing it and um, putting it out there. And I would encourage all of you to share this uh, video link with your friends, uh, get more people engaged with Green Apron because we're, we're on a path to doing some good stuff. And so with that, you all have a lovely, wonderful evening. Thank you, Dolly. And uh, we'll, we'll be back again, more to come. Thanks everyone. Bye.